Let's consider a candidate for a class and we'll choose something very simple to begin with. Let's consider the flipping of a coin. Now when we flip a coin what we will see is that it will land and it will land either heads up or obviously the other way in which it can land is with tails up as we can see represented by these two images of a coin. Now what we need to do I think at this stage is let's look ahead and let's ask a simple question. How would an object in a program represent this? Represent the flipping of a coin? Here we can see a suitable model to represent the flipping of a coin. We can see it has at its center a variable that I've called heads or tails CL. And here we can see there's a method called flip. Now when this is in the execution space, we will send it a message from an appropriate object, maybe a form object for example. And when we do that, we will see the message appearing as I'm showing here. The flip method will then execute. When it does, what it'll do it'll put in the center of the object a string heads. Of course, we also wanted to be able to put the string tails in the center. In other words, flip will flip the coin and will produce at the center of the object heads or tails. And we obviously wanted to do this at random. Now we're going to look at the message being sent again. There's the message. This method then executes in response to the message. And what it will do, it will produce tails on this particular occasion. And of course we want that to appear randomly. So there we can see the model of the object and how we want it to behave at runtime. Let's have another look at sending a message to this particular object. There's the message. The code in here will now execute and we will get in the center here either tails or heads and on this occasion the center is holding the string tails that's what the quotes are there for to remind us that in fact this is going to be a string so that variable in the middle is going to be called heads or tails cl and it's going to be capable of storing a string now the thing is we will have marked that as private which means that this particular variable is not available to the outside world whereas the method was because we made that public or we will be making it public when we write the code and we will be making the variable in the middle private when we write the code what we now need therefore is a mechanism that allows the outside world to gain access to the variable in the center what would be the point of having an object storing either tails or heads depending on a method if nobody could see it except the object itself and the methods around that particular center and what we do under these circumstances is we have another mechanism which I'm showing here and this mechanism is going to be a read-only property procedure and I'm going to give it the name heads or tails as you can see here and if you look closely that's almost the same name as the name of the variable heads or tails CL and I deliberately make these the same with the difference being the CL at the end of the variable name and this is because it's good practice in my view to do this now what does this read-only property procedure actually do then well it, because it's in this outer grey area, it can see what's stored in the middle. It can see the tails stored in the heads or tails CL private variable. So it is able to go and get a copy of it and send it to any other object that sends a message. So for example, if I now see heads or tails coming into this, what this is able to do is to see the tails in the center of the object. In other words, a path can be made from the center to this particular property procedure here and that path is in one direction because this is a read only property procedure there are other kinds of property procedures which we'll discuss later that are not just read only but this one is and what will happen a copy of that is taken it's passed via this property procedure and it's sent to whatever the object was that sent the message to this object what we need to be quite clear of here is that when we deal with property procedures, a property procedure needs to have a partnership with one of the variables in the center of the object. And that partnership I'm highlighting here with those red boxes. So we have a property procedure, a read-only one in this case, that has a relationship with one of the private variables in the center of the object. And this is key to our understanding of how property procedures actually work.